Nightline. If he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with, uh, he, he's become detached from reality. Tonight, new details about an inner circle's desperate attempts to prove to former President Trump that his claims of election fraud were false. Never before seen testimony about what went on inside the White House about how President Trump ignored his own top campaign advisors on election night and pushed untrue claims that the election was stolen despite family and staff telling him that he lost. ABC News Live has Jonathan Carl, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle and experts standing by. Fear at a summer camp for children. Authorities say an armed gunman entered through the lobby and fired into a full classroom, what ultimately led to the shooter's death. Also tonight, the major breakthrough on gun safety legislation, a bipartisan group of senators reaching a deal, possibly the most significant gun legislation in 30 years, but still falling short of President Biden's calls to ban assault weapons or raise the legal age from 18 to 21. Rachel Scott joins us from Capitol Hill. Life after tragedy, when the cameras leave and the dust settles, there are those left behind with the trauma and heartache of mass shootings. Our Martha Raddatz sat down with four survivors of the Sandy Hook massacre with their message to Uvalde. We're here for them in any way that they need, um, and I'm sorry that they're with us now. Recession fears on the rise. The S&P 500 and your 401k has fallen more than 20% below the record high set in January. As you pay more for gas and groceries, the warning that there will be more price hikes this summer. She's the heart of the team, even though she doesn't take to the court. Tonight, the story of a Celtics vice president who turned her battle with brain cancer into a nationwide movement. And we're going to get there, and we're going to be cancer-free. Yeah. I can't wait for that day. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting in tonight from Los Angeles. Thanks so much for streaming with us. New dramatic moments from the House January 6th Committee's second public hearing. This one focused on then-President Trump's continued fraud claims and how he apparently was told that he had lost repeatedly by top officials, but he refused to listen. Once again, former President Trump's old attorney general did not mince any words. The committee played video deposition of Bill Barr calling his former boss detached from reality on election fraud claims and that he believed the president had grown delusional. Republican Liz Cheney laid out how President Trump rejected campaign expert advice from the so-called Team Normal, headed by Trump's former campaign manager, and instead followed advice of, quote, an apparently inebriated Rudy Giuliani. The legal team for Giuliani denies the allegation that he was drunk. And according to the committee today, it wasn't just the big lie, it turned into the big payday. Trump supporters donated $100 million just in the first week after the election, many believing that their money would help overturn the results. Our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, leads us off tonight with more of the highlights. With recorded testimony from some of the people closest to Donald Trump, the January 6th committee revealed what was going on inside the White House late on election night 2020, as Trump was urged not to declare victory by his campaign manager. It was far too early to be making any calls like that. Um, ballots, ballots were still being counted. Ballots were still going to be counted for days. Um, and it was far too early to be making any proclamation like that. His senior strategist. To the best of my memory, and I was saying that we should not go and declare victory until we had a better sense of the numbers. His daughter. I don't know that I had a, a firm view um, as to what he should say uh, in that circumstance. The results were still being counted. Um, it was becoming clear that the race would not be called um, on election night. It was tense at the White House. Witness these photos taken on election night and published exclusively in my book, Betrayal. You see the anguish on their faces. But as Trump's family and top aides urged him not to declare victory, Rudy Giuliani, who some testified showed up at the White House intoxicated, offered Trump the only advice he wanted to hear. Late today, Giuliani's attorney said he wasn't drunk. And the mayor was definitely intoxicated, but I do not um, know uh, his level of talk intoxication when he spoke uh, with the president, for example. I think effectively, Mayor Giuliani was saying, we want it 
they're stealing it from us. Where'd all the votes come from? We need to go say that we won. The then president spoke at 2.30 a.m. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. Trump's campaign manager told the committee that in the days after the election, Trump turned away from his top advisors and toward another group led by Giuliani spinning unfounded conspiracy theories. There were two groups of family. We called them kind of my team and Rudy's team. I, I didn't mind being characterized as being part of Team Normal. I didn't think what was happening was necessarily honest or professional at that point in time. So yeah, that led to me stepping away. In the middle of the night, after Giuliani and lawyer Sidney Powell were making wild claims about rigged voting machines, about Italian spy satellites and German computers switching votes, about thousands of dead people voting, all of it false. But some Trump supporters believed them. I don't want to say that what we're doing is right. But if the election is being stolen, what is it going to take? Trump's own attorney general, Bill Barr, told the president there was no evidence of any widespread fraud that would change the election. But Trump remained focused on those wild and false conspiracy theories. I was somewhat demoralized because I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with uh, he, he's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. What they were proposing, I thought was nuts. And the theory was also completely nuts. Even son-in-law Jared Kushner said he wasn't happy with Giuliani's influence. Did you ever share, Mr. Kushner, your view of Mr. Giuliani? Did you ever share your perspective about him with the president? Um, I, I guess, uh, yes. Yeah, tell me what you said. Uh, basically, not the approach I would take if I was you. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it. And all the early claims uh, that I understood on, uh, were, were completely bogus and silly and usually based on complete misinformation. And Barr told the committee about a meeting in the Oval Office. And after that meeting, he spoke to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and Jared Kushner. I said, uh, how, long is, how long is he going to carry on with this uh, stolen election stuff? Where is this going to go? And by that time, uh, Meadows had caught up with me and uh, leaving the office and caught up with me and, and said uh, that uh, uh, he said, look, I, I, I think... Uh, that he's becoming more realistic and knows that there's a limit to how far he can take this. And then Jared said, you know, yeah, we're working on this. We're working on it. Weeks after the election, the former president continued to push the false claims. Barr went public to say there was no widespread fraud, infuriating the president. The president was as mad as I've ever seen him, and he was trying to control himself. And the president said, well, this is, you know, killing me. Uh, you didn't have to say this. You must have said this because you hate Trump. Virtually all the witnesses, taped and live, were Republicans, including Ben Ginsburg, America's highest profile Republican election lawyer. The simple fact is that the Trump campaign did not make its case. And the committee heard from Chris Steyerwalt, who worked for years as the Fox News election expert. He was there when Fox became the first network to declare Joe Biden the winner in Arizona. After the election, as of November 7th, in your judgment, what were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. He needed three of these states to change. And in order to do that, I mean, you're at, you're at uh, an infant, you're better off to play the Powerball uh, than to <laughs> have that come in. That really put things in perspective there. Jonathan Carl joins us now. John, we heard the committee start to cite evidence that the former president and his allies actually raised hundreds of millions of dollars from their false claims about the election. And according to the committee, none of that money actually went to efforts uh, to challenge the election results. As Zoe Lofgren, the congresswoman from California, put it, the big lie was also a big ripoff. And, and so where did the money go? 
Well, it, it went uh, to various organizations that have been created uh, by Trump supporters. Uh, it did not go to paying legal bills. In fact, as we've previously reported, uh, the legal bills uh, were being paid largely by the Republican National Committee. Uh, so this was an effort to to fund organizations that were uh, to be, you know, pro-Trump organizations, uh, some of which are still operating and raising money on this very stuff today. And we also heard Attorney General Merrick Garland say today that he's watching the hearings, as are his prosecutors. What's the significance of that? Well, uh, it's significant that they're watching. The big question, though, Lindsay, and one we just don't know, is whether or not they will ultimately decide to uh, prosecute anybody in Trump's inner circle or Trump himself. Uh, we're waiting, and I assume uh, they'll be watching carefully, and these hearings may weigh in on that decision. Watching as we all are. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Thank you. For more analysis of today's hearings, let's now bring in Khan Nowaday, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Thanks so much for joining us again, Khan. First, just explain to us why it was important for the committee to outline the origins of Trump's false claims about the election results and what he was being told by his closest advisors on the campaign and in the White House. I think the importance is this is a big part of the committee's case that Trump was at the center of this conspiracy, this uh, seditious conspiracy. And the reason it, it's important because they have to show that these allegations of election fraud are completely false. Because if they don't show that, then as Trump has been saying, and this is part of his defense or has been, is, well, I'm telling the truth, there was fraud. So the, it's very important for the committee to go allegation by allegation, which is what the committee did today, and to show, well, no, these are false allegations, and two, that Trump knew that they were false allegations. And the way they did that was they focused on testimony, direct testimony, from the people who told them and the people who would know that they were false allegations. What was the most compelling piece of information or testimony that you heard in today's hearing? I thought the most compelling testimony came from uh, the the prosecutors who would know that the election, uh, the, the allegations that there was fraud in this election in Georgia, in Detroit, in Philadelphia, that it's false. Um, so the testimony of former AG Barr, the testimony of Richard Donahue, the acting AG uh, at the time, who replaced for a period uh, AG Barr, and also uh, B.J. Pock, the U.S. attorney in Georgia at the time, Pock said he investigated it. He investigated the allegation about a suitcase full of votes, and there was no there there. And then Donahue, in turn, said, and guess what? We told Trump that this was false. And we heard that line from former Attorney General Bill Barr saying that the former president was detached from reality if he believed his claims about the election. I'm curious from a legal perspective, could that help or hurt the case against the president bearing any responsibility if his mental state was actually to the point where perhaps he believed the lies himself? And that's a great question, Lindsay, because that stuck out at me is something that might not necessarily help the committee, what the committee is trying to prove. Uh, the fact that Bill Barr said, well, he's detached from reality, that potentially could be Trump's, uh, as we put it, Trump card. He can, his defense could be, well, you know, I didn't, I believed it in my soul. And even though it wasn't true, I truly believe those things to be true. Did you believe that his testimony has been the most damning so far? I think Barr's testimony has been the, the most damning so far because he provides both ends. He provides, one, the testimony that the Department of Justice looked into all of these fraud allegations and it's all rubbish. And then, two, he provides the direct knowledge line to the president, the former president. And looking ahead to the next hearings, what did you hear today that you'd like to see more information presented on in the days ahead? I'd like to see, and I expect to see, number one, I, I think the committee is going to call back uh, Trump's campaign manager, Stepien. Uh, I, I think they were very disappointed that they had to go through at the last minute for, you know, very reasonable reasons um, that they had to use deposition testimony instead of live testimony. So I think His wife was having a baby, back. right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And there's, and I think that was, the, of course, the right call to, to make. Um, so I think they're going to call him back. Um, I, I also am interested to see how they start uh, 
teasing out who the members of this conspiracy are. They teased that out at the in their opening last Thursday when they pointed to that meeting with Giuliani, with Flynn, with Sidney Powell. And then even today, they made that juxtaposition of there's Team Normal uh, and then there's Giuliani's team. And I think it's fairly obvious that when you have a conspiracy, it can't be a conspiracy of one. There have to be other members of the conspiracy. And so I'm interested to see what evidence they have uh, against the other conspirators. Former federal prosecutor, Mr. Khan, nowadays, appreciate you coming on with us again. Thank you. Now to possible progress on Capitol Hill on gun legislation for the first time in decades. The bipartisan team of senators working on reforms announced a framework deal on Sunday. So what comes next? ABC News' congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has those details. Tonight, with a deal in hand, a bipartisan group of senators is racing to finalize the most significant gun restrictions in decades. We must continue working with the urgency that this moment demands. Republican John Cornyn, that Texas senator who was on the scene the day after the Evaldi massacre, wants to move quickly. Uh, my personal aspiration would be for us to get this done in the next two weeks. After nearly 30 years of congressional inaction, a breakthrough. Ten Republicans joining ten Democrats backing the framework, which would strengthen background checks, allowing juvenile records to be screened for gun buyers under 21, expand gun restrictions for convicted domestic violence abusers, add funding for states to enact red flag laws to temporarily take guns away from people considered dangerous and bolster school security and mental health programs. This bill will not end the epidemic of gun violence overnight, but it is substantial. It is significant. It will save lives. But it falls short of what the president was calling for. No ban on assault weapons and the age to purchase those firearms will stay at 18. The vast majority of Republicans were opposed to those measures, even after hearing the pleas from the victims' families in Uvalde. Anything that you heard that would get you to support that? No, because the stories are tragic, obviously. I have young kids, they're tragic for me. The truth of the matter is, is that raising the age from 18 to 21, all that does is take away the constitutional rights of 19 and 20 year olds in the United States. In a statement, the president writing the proposal does not do everything that I think is needed, but it reflects important steps in the right direction. So perhaps baby steps, but progress nonetheless. Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, still some hurdles to come, but this is the most optimistic that we've heard both parties in years on gun reforms. What comes next? It really is, Lindsay. Tonight, Republican senators, very optimistic. Se Texas Senator John Cornyn says that he wants to get this across the finish line over the next two weeks. And we put that question to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. He says that he's hopeful that senators can get there, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott, our thanks to you. Joining us now for more on the bipartisan gun framework in the Senate and day two of the historic January 6th hearings is Democratic Representative Jim Himes of Connecticut. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Let's begin with today's hearing. Was there anything at all that you heard that, that really surprised you? Well, two things, Lindsay. Number one, um, you know, the attack on these hearings are that it's just fake news and this is just the Democrats, you know, not being fair. What we heard, as we heard in the last hearing, was from lots of Trump people, from the Attorney General, Bill Barr. We heard from Jared Kushner. We heard from uh, 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 Trump's campaign manager, all of whom are saying exactly the same thing, which is that we told President Trump that he lost the race. And the reason I tell you that that's important is because one of the real weaknesses we have in this country is the fact that, you know, according to polling, something like 60 percent of Republicans continue, continue to believe that the election was not a fair one. And that's something that needs to change. You know, the other thing that really struck me was, so why? Why, if Donald Trump has been told by all of his own people that he lost the election, why does he do this? And we got a little hint today when we learned that maybe it had something to do with the $250 million that his campaign was able to raise through just, you know, eight, nine, ten fundraisers a day propagating this big lie, telling Americans that their democracy had been stolen from them, even though they knew that that was not true. And you've said that you didn't appreciate just how violent the day had gotten until the Capitol Police started moving furniture from the 1800s in front of a door. And despite the billions of dollars that the U.S. spends on defense, you ultimately had to rely on an antique desk to protect you. 18 months later, how concerned are you that history might repeat itself again? 
You know, I don't worry too much about another January 6th. Uh, again, it was shameful enough that it happened. And as long as we have the instinct that led to January 6th, as long as the ex-president is in Mar-a-Lago saying that this is all, uh, you know, a fraud, that this is, uh, you know, somehow a figment of the Democrats' imagination, despite the fact that all of his own people are testifying that they told him that he had lost the election, that could mean we go through this in 2024. Will it take exactly the same form it took on January 6th? Probably not. But that's still a terribly, terribly dangerous thing out there. And you were, of course, were a leader of the House Intelligence Committee's efforts during the first impeachment of former President Trump. You and fellow Democrats methodically laid out your case, yet President Trump did not face consequences then. Any concern that the same could happen with these hearings, ultimately? Well, I certainly hear from a lot of my constituents a real hunger for accountability. You know, lots and lots of people who broke into this building are going to jail, folks that broke windows. I got an up-close and personal look at them on January 6th. You know, these were folks who really believed um, that their democracy had been stolen. But what about the people like President Trump, like Rudy Giuliani, like so many of the people around the president that propagated that lie? And, you know, we're having this debate about whether laws were broken. Um, you you know, if trying to stop the peaceful transition of power in the United States for the first time in its two and a half centuries isn't a crime, um, we've, we've, we've got a problem. You know, something I thought that was really interesting that we learned in the, the first hearing from Republican Liz Cheney was that Republicans in Congress appealed to the White House for pardons. Do you feel now, Congressman, that those members of Congress should be named by the committee so that the American public knows? Uh, they absolutely should be. Um, look, our system relies on transparency. Our system relies on people like me going every two years to our voters and saying, I'd like my job back, please, right? And, and in the service of that, um, people need to know. Uh, if you did feel that you needed to request a pardon, why was that? What, what was the consciousness of guilt that led you to believe that you had to get a pardon? But yes, of course, if the committee has that evidence and that evidence is compelling, it needs to be made public. The consciousness of guilt, uh, that's an interesting way to put it. So, so lastly, your district is adjacent to the site of the Sandy Hook massacre. You said moments of silence after shootings now just make your head explode. After hearing about the bipartisan framework deal in the Senate, do you feel that this time actually is different? Do you think that this framework becomes the first meaningful gun legislation in decades, or is it still not enough? Well, it's definitely not enough. I mean, we know that in this country there are probably 10 things, universal background check, raising the age at which an American can uh, buy an assault rifle. There's lots of things that are not getting done here. Um, and you're right. I mean, as somebody who lives really close by Sandy Hook Elementary School, it's painful to see what we count as progress. But you know what? It's progress. This is the first time in three decades, in 30 years, that the, that the federal government has been able to advance. Getting something um, is worthy of celebration. And when the consequences of doing nothing is more dead Americans. Again, I would have liked to have seen a lot more in this deal, but I'm going to celebrate the passage of this deal when that, uh, when that happens. All right. Representative Jim Himes, we thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you joining us tonight. Thank you. We're joined now by Republican Congressman Pete Sessions of Texas. Congressman, thanks so much for joining us. At least 20 million Americans watched the first night of public hearings last week, and we saw the second day from the committee today. Have you watched any of the hearings at all so far? Lindsay, I have. I've, I've spent a little bit of time watching not only uh, the committee, but also the uh, important people that came before to talk about their uh, vision and viewpoint about what happened uh, now almost a year and a half ago. And I did see that. And what are your thoughts so far? Well, my thoughts so far are that it is my hope that these uh, hearings also go further past not just uh, the election, the weeks preceding uh, January 6th, but also afterwards where there have been uh, evidence of uh, what, what General, Attorney General Barr said today was not a widespread vote uh, uh, belief uh, across the country. But now a year and a half later, there has been a development of a good bit of data and information uh, about the importance of what I believe federal law enforcement is now aware of and looking at. And one person who also said that he's watching is Attorney General Merrick Garland, along with the prosecutors who are making cases against January 6th defendants. And this committee has focused on trying to lay out President Trump's role in spurring the attack on the Capitol. Do you think that the case could actually lead to the former president facing any direct consequences? Well, I think the consequences have been paid in lots of respects. 
to the indictment on many of us, not just Republicans, but also members of Congress, who actually, in selling the ideas that we have and that we all have about fair elections, that we need to be able to discuss these issues. We need to be able to speak with people who are officials that run campaigns. We've been trying to do this in Dallas, Texas now for almost a year and a half. And the people who run the elections will not speak about them, even though there are uh, widespread abuses in their own system, some 55,000 votes in Dallas County alone in the 2020 elections that after they were voted, they were removed and then re-voted several days later. These are abnormalities and inconsistencies that we need to speak about. I think they happened all across the country. And today's testimony laid out the origins of former President Trump's claims of a stolen election starting on election night and how in the weeks that followed, many of his closest advisors told him that there was no basis to those claims after they had been investigated. That includes former Attorney General Bill Barr, who said in recorded testimony of Trump that, quote, he's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. What do you make of that assessment coming from someone like Bill Barr? Well, I, I heard the general say that, and in fact, uh, what I'm suggesting to you is that there is lots of pet pre uh, uh, evidence that is available to law enforcement, and that was a year and a half ago. It now has begun, become very apparent that there are questions of abnormality. Was it right. Fraud? Well, he said, Bill know. Barr said at the time that there were some abnormalities, but none of them would have uh, amounted to ch overturning the outcome of the election. So I think that that's really where the substantive issue comes, not if there were abnormalities, but would it have changed the outcome? Do you disagree with that? Well, no, no. Let, let's agree with that. There were January 6th was about two states where there were these abnormalities, where we were asking for the states to relook at them. Two states would have not turned that election over either. But I think that what I'm suggesting to you is, is that we now know much more now that we did not know at the time. Over the weekend, we saw what could be the first meaningful action on gun reform federally in three decades, and it appears to be bipartisan. If it makes its way to the House, where do you stand on this issue? There's much in this that we have heard about that sounds very promising. And that is that we have known for quite some time, for over 20 years, that the problems are in schools. They're with uh, juveniles who find themselves in uh, a stress and strain circumstance, uh, mental health issues, and that we need to focus on those. When we talk about mental health, we're now talking about a lot of sensitive areas about who's going to make these determinations and what that outcome would be. I think that authorities still need to know where they've got a dangerous circumstance. One of the things we need to change is a HIPAA law, or even psychologists who receive information about the threat of something, they have to be able to make that determination and say that out loud to, to, to you know, law enforcement people. These are the kinds of real changes that we need. Congressman Pete Sessions of Texas, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming Lindsay, on the show. Lindsay, thank you very much. Now to Idaho, where 31 men with alleged links to a white nationalist group were arrested one block from a pride event. The men apparently associated with the group The Patriot Front were charged with conspiracy to riot after a tipster reported seeing them dressed like a little army. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas with the very latest. Tonight, authorities in Idaho say they narrowly averted an attack by white nationalists at a gay pride celebration. That level of preparation is not something you see every day. It was very clear to us immediately that this was a riotous group. 31 members of the Patriot Front are now facing misdemeanor charges of conspiracy to riot. Authorities say their plans were thwarted when a concerned citizen reported seeing about 20 people loading into a U-Haul van on Saturday police stopping them less than a quarter mile from the event. It, quote, looked like a little army. Investigators say they recovered shields, riot gear, and at least one smoke grenade from the truck along with documents laying out the group's plan for a riot. Members traveling to Idaho from 10 other states. The white supremacist group Patriot Front forming in the aftermath of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. We are dealing with a very large pool of people here in the U.S. that, that 
truly believe in these ideas and at times are willing to act out violently. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, the officers who made those arrests have been receiving threats. Lindsay, the police chief in Idaho says he and his fellow officers have received death threats since those arrests. And there's concern tonight that this case symbolizes the worry that pride activities this month could be targeted by hate groups, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you as always. Now we shift to our nation's economy with Wall Street taking yet another drop in recession fears resurfacing. This is gas prices continue to rise with Americans paying an estimated average of more than $5 a gallon. ABC's Ariel Reshef brings us this report. Tonight, new fears of a recession after a dismal day on Wall Street. The S&P 500, the index tied to most 401ks, finishing down nearly 4% for the day and more than 20% for the year, officially entering so-called bear market territory. The stock market is suffering through a very bad case of indigestion because inflation has been surprisingly high and persistent. Persistent and getting worse. Prices rising from the grocery store to the gas pump. I'm definitely not buying premium. This Minnesota station sign saying it all. We hate our gas prices too. Now, major corporations are warning of even higher prices. Kraft Heinz, the company behind brands like Miracle Whip and Maxwell House Coffee, reportedly telling retailers it plans to raise prices later this summer. Last week, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen tried to dispel fears of a recession, but more and more prominent economists are now predicting one. Some potentially somber news on the horizon for all of us economically. Ariel Reshef joins us now from Wall Street. And Ariel, now the Federal Reserve is meeting this week, expected to raise interest rates once again. That's right, Lindsay. The last time they met, they raised interest rates by half a point. This time, there's talk they could raise rates by three quarters of a point. Now it's that delicate balance of cooling the economy without triggering a recession. Lindsay. Such a delicate balance there, as you say. Ariel, our thanks to you. And when we come back, the deadly police shooting at a summer camp with 150 children and the quick-thinking staffers. Actor Kevin Spacey charged with four counts of sexual assault. We have the latest details. But up next, the first possible gun deal in decades in the works. Our Martha Raddatz sits down with four of the Newtown students who are now teenagers about the day in 2012 that changed their lives forever. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. 
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. While the families in Uvalde demand answers, they continue to bury their loved ones. Today, 10-year-old Tess Mata, remembered for her love of softball, soccer, and her videos that she hoped would go viral on TikTok, she was laid to rest. This is some victims' families where the investigation may be closed using a Texas loophole that keeps records sealed after a suspect dies. It's been almost a decade since a gunman murdered 20 first grade students and six educators with an assault weapon in Newtown. And for the survivors of Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, watching Uvalde unfold was devastating. So this week, co-anchor Martha Raditz recently sat down with four Newtown students, now all teenagers, to talk about how that day in 2012 changed their lives forever and what it felt like to see another classroom attacked. Three of the four have never shared their stories before and out of respect for their privacy, we're only only using their first names. Andrew, Jackie, Nicole, and Maggie were second and third graders when the gunman entered Sandy Hook Elementary School a decade ago. Children. Today, they are teenagers, all students at nearby Newtown High School. But they all vividly remember the shooting in heartbreaking detail. We heard the sounds pretty early on. And I remember looking at my teacher's face and her shock and just, like this, we knew it wasn't a drill. I do remember my thoughts of I'm, I'm going to die and like I'm not gonna make it out of the school, like there's no way that I'm making it out. When you're seven years old and you think you're gonna die, what, what does that even mean? I was towards the front near the door and I remember thinking if someone comes in our classroom, like I'm gonna be first, I'm not gonna make it out. After just four and a half minutes of shooting with an AR-15, 26 people, 20 children killed. The images from that day capturing the chaos and immeasurable pain of an entire community. The children too young at the time to fully realize the horror and brutality of what was unfolding around them. So you didn't imagine that it was a gunman? just didn't ever enter your mind that a gun when they told me what happened you know I still had trouble comprehending exactly what happened you know you wouldn't expect a second grader to come to that conclusion on their own really all four lost classmates friends and neighbors for Maggie the shooting claimed the life of her best friend seven-year-old Daniel Barden it was very traumatic me, for me because there was no comfort whatsoever. No one could comfort anyone else because it was just pure devastation and loss. And we all loved this boy so much. And I didn't know that those sounds I was listening to was my friend being murdered. Explain to people how this has changed you as a human being and altered your life. I think trauma stays with a person forever. And it finds a way to manifest itself into all aspects of everything. I know when you walked out, you were told to close your eyes. Yeah. Put your hand on a friend in front of you so you wouldn't see anything. You opened your eyes. I did. I was, I was told I was in the back of the line, um, and there was glass and obviously blood, and I didn't want to step on anything. So I did, I did open my eyes. Um, so, yeah. That's a thought that probably does not go away. No. Think if people saw what you saw, who don't want any tighter gun controls, they might change their mind. Absolutely. That trauma, impossible to forget. I couldn't get the sounds out of my head during the night. I couldn't 
close my eyes without reliving it. And I remember being embarrassed because my friends would have sleepovers and I wouldn't be able to go because my anxiety just wouldn't let me be away from my family or by myself. When you heard about Evalde and the kids, where were you and, and what were you thinking? I was just thinking about all the families that are in their houses right now telling their children that their siblings and that their friends and their classmates are gone. And it just really broke me to know that after 10 years of everyone giving us their thoughts and prayers and, you know, after 10 years of everyone saying enough is enough and never again after Sandy Hook, it happened again. And so devastatingly. These survivors are furious that no compromise has come and that more lives have been lost. Our government and just we as a nation, we know the solutions. We have proposed the solutions. We've proposed limited magazines. We've proposed uh, changing ages for buying an assault rifle that you can buy at the age of 18. We've known about these issues. We've known the ways we can stop them. I think what we know just needs to come to fruition. All of these teens scarred by that four and a half minutes of terror and carnage, imagining what it was like for the students in Uvalde who had to endure more than an hour of waiting before police finally entered. What would you say to the survivors of Uvalde, the other children? who saw horrible things, who might have been in that classroom. It's hard thinking that they're going to have to live the rest of their lives with, with this trauma. We completely stand with them and support them. And as devastating as it is that they now have this community of people who have endured a tragedy, they have a community of people who understand them. Um, and I think that has been something that's kept me going, is that the people around me know what I'm going through. And I hate that they do, and I hate that now these little kids are part of our community, but we're here for them in any way that they need. Um, and I'm sorry that they're with us now. Our thanks to Martha for that. Still ahead here on Prime, country star Toby Keith reveals his battle with cancer. And we take a look at the newest EGOT holder by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day from the Lincoln Center, paying tribute to actor Philip Baker Hall. He was in so many memorable roles. He left us at the age of 90 years old. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's how we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live.
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. With a Tony Award last night as a producer of the Broadway musical A Strange Loop, singer and actress Jennifer Hudson joins Elite Company as an EGOT winner. Let's take a look by the numbers. With her win at the 75th Tony Awards, Hudson has now achieved the entertainment world's Grand Slam, winning an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. The American Idol alum has won two Grammys, taking home trophies in 2009 and 2017, and earning six more nominations throughout her career. In 2007, she picked up a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for her role in Dreamgirls, and in 2021, she grabbed a Daytime Emmy Award for her work on the animated short Baba Yaga. With Hudson's Tony win, 17 artists have now reached EGOT status in all of history. That includes legends like Rita Moreno, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Mike Nichols, and Audrey Hepburn. Hudson is the second black woman to reach EGOT status, joining Whoopi Goldberg, and she's the fifth woman overall to win the distinction. And with 11 in Tony nominations, A Strange Loop was the most nominated show of the year as Broadway celebrates its first full year reopening since the pandemic. And Hudson now has an extra reason to celebrate. Our congratulations to Jay Hud. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The major action by the U.S. Navy grounding all non-essential flights. And how one of the teams in the finals right now is stepping up to support one of its biggest fans during her battle with cancer. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCNews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find. Unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. The House Select Committee using taped testimony from 10 of former President Donald Trump's closest advisors presenting evidence Trump knew he'd lost the election, but continues claiming even to this day it was stolen from him. 
baseless allegations of voter fraud, the committee says emboldened Trump supporters to attack the Capitol on January 6th. In this pre-recorded interview, former Attorney General Bill Barr detailing the multiple meetings where he told Trump his claims of election fraud were bogus. I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with uh, he, he's become detached from reality. Several other former top aides, including Jason Miller and Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, testifying they cautioned the former president against listening to attorneys Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, who were peddling election conspiracy theories. The U.S. is one step closer to potentially historic gun reform. A bipartisan group of 20 senators backing a deal on principle, a significant breakthrough as lawmakers face pressure to act. If passed, the plan would strengthen background checks, allowing juvenile records to be screened for gun buyers younger than 21, expand gun restrictions for convicted domestic violence abusers, allocate funding for states enacting red flag laws to temporarily remove guns from those considered dangerous, and bolster school school security and mental health programs. Though the deal would not ban assault weapons or raise the age limit to buy them from 18 to 21 as President Biden had been calling for, he did give his stamp of approval. Police near Dallas, Texas have shot and killed a person with a gun at a sports and fitness venue. About 150 kids attending day camp today at the Duncanville Fieldhouse. He fired off a shot into one of those classrooms, but no one was injured. He then moved into the gymnasium where more children were, but that's when police arrived. There was an exchange of gunfire. The gunman was hit. He was taken to the hospital and died from his injuries there, but the police chief there stressing his officers did what they were trained to do, which is go in and stop the threat. The U.S. Navy taking hundreds of its aircraft in the U.S. out of the skies following three crashes in less than a week, all of them in Southern California, two of them with fatalities. The Navy saying the pause will ground all Navy aircraft not deployed overseas to review risk management practices and conduct training in threat and error management processes. Last Thursday, the crew of a Navy Seahawk helicopter surviving a crash, but just a day before, a Navy pilot on a training mission was killed when his F-18 crashed. And days before that, five Marines were killed when their Osprey went down near Coachella. London Met Police announcing actor Kevin Spacey has been formally charged with four counts of sexual assault against three men and one count of causing a person to engage in penetrative sexual activity without consent. The incidents mainly took place between 2005 and 2008, with one in 2013. The charges come one week after a federal judge said a civil lawsuit filed against Spacey by actor Anthony Rapp could proceed in New York City. Spacey is scheduled to appear in court on the UK charges Thursday. Country music star Toby Keith revealed over the weekend he's been battling stomach cancer. The longtime singer took to Instagram to announce that he'd been diagnosed in the fall and spent the last six months receiving chemotherapy, radiation and surgery, writing so far so good but that he needed time to breathe, recover and relax. Keith had been slated to embark on a tour in support of his latest album, Peso in My Pocket, with the first show for June 17th. He said on Instagram he looked forward to spending time with family and would see his fans again sooner than later. Welcome back. It's a high stakes time for the Boston Celtics. The team is preparing for game five of the NBA Finals. But while there is a championship on the line, there is also a focus on the heart of the team, a woman who's never played a game. ABC's Will Reeve introduces us to Heather Walker, the Celtics' biggest fan whose battle with brain cancer sparked a nationwide movement. Right back to Horford inside for the slam. The storied legacy of the Boston Celtics has been long solidified in sports history with 17 championship banners and potentially another around the corner. But for many who love the Celtics, their real team hero isn't basketball legends like Bill Russell or Bob Cousy, or even current stars Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown. Please join us in honoring today's hero among us, Heather Walker. It's like a dream come true. A longtime vice president for the Boston Celtics, for Heather Walker, this return to TD Garden is a homecoming after a long and difficult year. I just can't believe that I'm back here. Last summer, Walker began to experience painful headaches. At first, doctors chalked up her symptoms to exhaustion due to her busy schedule as a working mother of two. 
And just days before her 50th birthday, a CT scan revealed a devastating diagnosis, stage four glioblastoma, a rare and aggressive form of brain cancer. The same illness that took the lives of Senator John McCain, Senator Ted Kennedy, and President Joe Biden's son, Beau. When I got the diagnosis, I couldn't believe it. It was surreal. Like, I had no idea what glioblastoma was. Uh, brain cancer? I have no, like, what am I doing here? The day after the golf ball-sized mass was discovered growing in Walker's brain, she was wheeled in for brain surgery, followed by months of radiation, chemotherapy, and treatment. Her diagnosis came as a shock to those around her, especially her colleagues with the Celtics, who know Walker as a gregarious and committed team player. It was like being hit with a, an avalanche. Heather means everything to the Celtics organization. She's really our heart and soul. She's such a force of nature, such a like person with so much life. Well wishes began to pour in from across the country. Just want you to know that we pulling for you. We love you. Thinking of you, praying for you and your family. Love you, Heather. In the weeks after her diagnosis, Walker created the Move for Heather Challenge. Join me as I move for Heather. It can be walking, biking, even get some shots up on the court. An initiative that aims to raise awareness and funds for brain cancer research. We are asking people to do something that moves you. The campaign asks people to check things off their bucket list and spend time with loved ones. We had um, a friend of ours jump out of, the, uh, out of an airplane. We've had my mom's best friend did a quilt, you know, and like we've just, just had basically anything, anything, anything that moves you, anything that moves you. With over $600,000 raised in under a year, Walker is determined to share her story in an effort to bring awareness to the disease, raise funds for much needed treatments, and someday find a cure for cancer. I gotta go through another surgery? Like, am I gonna be able to talk after this? I don't know, but it's not fair. It's just not fair. Sorry. <laughs> just to help us. Why can't you help us? Cancer has been around for so long. It's time that we pull those resources together globally and we fight this and we get rid of cancer. It's time, it's, it's enough. Hashtag move for Heather has inspired countless people to live life to the fullest and demonstrated what being a Celtic is all about. Walker remains unfailingly positive and steadfast in her hope that someday soon, not only will she be back on the court celebrating an NBA title with the Celtics, but there will be a cure for glioblastoma and all forms of cancer. There is hope. Just stay positive, keep on moving. We're gonna get there and we're gonna be cancer free. Yes. I can't wait for that day. We're all rooting for you, Heather. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, take a look at these students with their pens competing at a calligraphy competition at a school in China. You have to wonder what they're writing about there. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the National Park closed after unprecedented rainfall led to washed out roads and concerns about tourists getting stranded. And the terrible day on Wall Street with at least one index now in bear market territory. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. 
the fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is, that is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast. Wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. All Yellowstone National Park entrances have been closed in the wake of unprecedented rainfall, causing substantial flooding, rock slides, and mudslides on roadways, the National Park Service announced. Some roads have been washed out completely, and others are covered in mud or rocks. Power has also been knocked out in multiple parts of the park, officials said. More rain is in the forecast for the next few days, according to park officials who said they don't want anyone to get stranded. Dangerous heat conditions will impact millions throughout our country. Excessive heat warnings and watches issued from Midwest to the Southwest. Widespread hot air and humidity will lead to triple-digit temperatures. The Supreme Court has ruled against immigrants who are seeking their release from long periods of detention while they fight deportation orders. In two decisions released today, the court said that the immigrants who fear persecution have sent back to their native countries have no right under federal law to a bond hearing at which they could argue for their freedom no matter how long they're held. The justice has also ruled six to three to limit the immigrants' ability to band together in court, an outcome that Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote will leave many vulnerable non-citizens unable to protect their rights. Now to the dramatic moments from the House January 6th Committee's second public hearing. This one focused on then-President Trump's continued fraud claims and how he apparently was told he had lost repeatedly by top officials in his campaign and in the White House, but refused to listen. Former Attorney General Bill Barr even calling his former boss detached from reality on election fraud claims. ABC News' Chief Washington Correspondent Jonathan Carl has the highlights from today's second day of testimony. With recorded testimony from some of the people closest to Donald Trump, the January 6th committee revealed what was going on inside the White House late on election night 2020, as Trump was urged not to declare victory by his campaign manager. It was far too early to be making any calls like that. Um, ballots, ballots were still being counted. Ballots were still going to be counted for days. Um, and it was far too early to be making any proclamation like that. His senior strategist. To the best of my memory, and I was saying that we should not go and declare victory until we had a better sense of the numbers. His daughter. I don't know that I had a, a firm view um, as to what he should say. Uh, in that circumstance, the results were still being counted. Um, it was becoming clear that the race would not be called. Um, on election night. It was tense at the White House. Witness these photos taken on election night and published exclusively in my book, Betrayal. You see the anguish on their faces. But as Trump's family and top aides urged him not to declare victory, Rudy Giuliani, who some testified showed up at the White House intoxicated, offered Trump the only advice he wanted to hear. Late today, Giuliani's attorney said he wasn't drunk. And the mayor was definitely intoxicated, but I do not, um know uh, his level of talk intoxication when he spoke uh, with the president, for example. I think effectively, Mayor Giuliani was saying, we want it, they're stealing it from us, where'd all the votes come from? We need to go say that we won. The then president spoke at 2.30 a.m. This is a fraud on the American public. Yeah. This is an embarrassment to our country. Yeah. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. Trump's campaign manager told the committee that in the days after the election, Trump turned away from his top advisors and toward another group led by Giuliani spinning unfounded conspiracy theories. There were two groups of family. We called them kind of my team and Rudy's team. I, I didn't mind being characterized as being part of Team Normal. I didn't think what was happening was necessarily honest or professional at that point in time. So yeah. 
that led to me stepping away. In the middle of the night, after Giuliani and lawyer Sidney Powell were making wild claims about rigged voting machines, about Italian spy satellites and German computers switching votes, about thousands of dead people voting, all of it false. But some Trump supporters believed them. I don't want to say that what we're doing is right. But if the election is being stolen, what is it going to take? Trump's own attorney general, Bill Barr, told the president there was no evidence of any widespread fraud that would change the election. But Trump remained focused on those wild and false conspiracy theories. I was somewhat demoralized because I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with uh, he, he's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. What they were proposing, I thought was nuts. And the theory was also completely nuts. Even son-in-law Jared Kushner said he wasn't happy with Giuliani's influence. Did you ever share, Mr. Kushner, your view of Mr. Giuliani? Did you ever share your perspective about him with the president? Um, I, I guess, uh, yes. It, tell me what you said. Basically, not the approach I would take if I was you. I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was And, uh, you know, I didn't want to be a part of it. And all the early claims uh, that I understood on, uh, were, were completely bogus and silly and usually based on complete misinformation. And Barr told the committee about a meeting in the Oval Office. And after that meeting, he spoke to Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and Jared Kushner. I said, uh, how, long is, how long is he going to carry on with this uh, stolen election stuff? Where is this going to go? And by that time, uh, Meadows had caught up with me and uh, leaving the office and caught up with me and, and said uh, that uh, uh, he said, look, I, I, I think... Uh, that he's becoming more realistic and knows that there's a limit to how far he can take this. And then Jared said, you know, yeah, we're working on this. We're working on it. Weeks after the election, the former president continued to push the false claims. Barr went public to say there was no widespread fraud, infuriating the president. The president was as mad as I've ever seen him, and he was trying to control himself. And the president said, well, this is, you know, killing me. Uh, you didn't have to say this. You must have said this because you hate Trump. Virtually all the witnesses, taped and live, were Republicans, including Ben Ginsburg, America's highest profile Republican election lawyer. The simple fact is that the Trump campaign did not make its case. And the committee heard from Chris Steyerwalt, who worked for years as the Fox News election expert. He was there when Fox became the first network to declare Joe Biden the winner in Arizona. After the election, as of November 7th, in your judgment, what were the chances of President Trump winning the election? After that point? Yes. None. He needed three of these states to change. And in order to do that, I mean, you're at, you're at uh, an infant, you're better off to play the Powerball uh, than to <laughs> have that come in. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl. And joining us now for more analysis is ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, I want to get your overall take on today's hearing. And do you think that the Republican wing of Trump loyalists may be now in damage control? I think they're in distraction con uh, mode mm. as much as they're in damage control. They are trying to talk about anything other than these hearings. They're talking about inflation and gas prices and, and saying the Democrats are overreaching here. They don't have a voice inside that room, Lindsay, that was in part by design, whether you agree or, or disagree with the strategy. Kevin McCarthy chose not to have people on the committee when he was told he couldn't have the people he wanted on the committee. And the result is you have a one-sided argument, but a very effective argument, because we've seen Democrats tease this out with the two Republicans in the room as well, uh, very meticulously using the words of people in the Trump inner circle and even his own family to establish that he knew he lost, the people in his orbit knew he lost, and still they went ahead and tried to push the big lie all the way up through January 6th and even beyond.
And on the flip side, how are Democrats capitalizing on this moment? They see this as a key moment to outline the choice, Lindsay. They say this is what the kind of leadership you'd get, the governance you'd get if Republicans are back in control. They're trying to take a little bit of a step back here because they recognize that most voters aren't going to vote exclusively on January 6th. But they also have said, we've seen committee members say in the last couple of days that this is essentially a giant referral to, uh, to criminal authorities, the Department of Justice and prosecutors in places like Georgia that have investigations, and also a referral to the American people to remind people of the horrors of that day and to remind them that those are not necessarily done, that this is not just some event from the history books. They have tried to make that, that connection through how, how things are going on right now in elections that are continued to, to take place and potentially in the future. And again, make the choice instead of a referendum. That's how Democrats see this as being uh, politically manageable and even sellable to the American people. And we just heard there in Jonathan Carl's piece, former Attorney General Bill Barr said then President Trump had, quote, become detached from reality and that he wasn't showing any interest in what the actual facts were. How surreal is it to hear an attorney general speak this way of any president, let alone the one he served? Oh, it's incredible, especially given who Bill Barr uh, is and was. He was seen as a Trump loyalist in that job, uh, and as he acknowledged, he was doing what he could to try to prove or disprove the president's theories as misguided as they were. And he comes back with fact after fact after fact, saying, that's not correct, Mr. President, that's not right, it's BS, it's wild, it's untrue, and still to get that kind of pushback. Maybe just as remarkable to me was the testimony from Trump's hand-picked U.S. attorney in the Northern District of Georgia, who also was going through this evidence and also presenting back to his superior saying there's nothing there there's nothing there and the fact that they told that to the president directly that he knew it that he's being told it from his attorney general and his family members his campaign officials and still went ahead with it speaks a lot to his state of mind and it starts to create a, a larger picture of what was going on in that moment that could inclu include criminal culpability for people around the former president but you're right to have the sitting attorney general say that the president was disconnected from reality that he left the job a month before he thought he would have to because he didn't want to be part of it anymore beyond remarkable. You have to wonder, the, the Trump re loyalists who remain, how they're going to digest all of that. In the meantime, I'm curious what you think about uh, the way they tied the money the former president fundraised off of the big lie, about $250 million as a key driver when it came to, to radical storming our nation's capital. Yeah, you heard members say it was the big lie became the big grift. And I think that's actually a very important thread that connects so much of what we know around January 6th, whether it's the Stop the Steal organizers and the white nationalist movement that was around it, uh, the people in the Trump orbit and the extended orbit, including members of the family who were involved in pushing this at every step, the, the whole network of state and local officials, people like Rudy Giuliani and the lawyers that came in here, uh, all of them had a profit motive in this. And to know that they were uh, soliciting donations donations in the, in the, under the guise of saying this was about some kind of a legal effort that in some cases didn't exist or had long since been disproven, I think tells you a lot about this. And I, I do think that was a, perhaps a buried headline in today and something we're going to see play out in some of the, the future hearings is how the money, follow the money, as they often said about Watergate. That's a big storyline and a big piece of what happened in around January 6th. And tomorrow night, of course, you'll be joining us for our primary night coverage. You've been monitoring the impact of the big lie and Trump's influence on the party for some time now. How much of a difference do you feel that the hearings will make? It will be an interesting couple of test cases because you have some races in South Carolina, two incumbent House members in, particu in particular, Tom Rice and Nancy Mace. Both of them have stood up against the big lie, and they're hoping to withstand primary challengers that Trump has backed. That would be a major statement. At the same time, out in Nevada, you have candidates up and down the ballot who are supporting the big lie. That were Some of them were, were essentially working for the Trump campaign and pushing this all the way. Candidate for Secretary of State who still says he wouldn't have certified the last election. If candidates like that prevail, you will see the real relevance of what's going on inside the committee room play out in real time. Even if it's a mixed bag of a night for former President Trump, you're going to have more candidates almost certainly on the ballot this fall who still continue to, to spread misinformation about the last election and might put themselves in a position, might leave themselves in a position to actually do some of the things that Trump was asking to be done after the 2020 election. Rick Klein, always appreciate you for your time and insight. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lindsay. Now to possible progress on Capitol Hill on gun legislation for the first time in decades. The bipartisan team of senators working on reforms announced a framework deal on Sunday. So what comes next? ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the details. 
Tonight, with a deal in hand, a bipartisan group of senators is racing to finalize the most significant gun restrictions in decades. We must continue working with the urgency that this moment demands. Republican John Cornyn, that Texas senator who was on the scene the day after the Evaldi massacre, wants to move quickly. Uh, my personal aspiration would be for us to get this done in the next two weeks. After nearly 30 years of congressional inaction, a breakthrough. Ten Republicans joining ten Democrats backing the framework, which would strengthen background checks, allowing juvenile records to be screened for gun buyers under 21, expand gun restrictions for convicted domestic violence abusers, add funding for states to enact red flag laws, to temporarily take guns away from people considered dangerous, and bolster school security and mental health programs. This bill will not end the epidemic of gun violence overnight, but it is substantial. It is significant. It will save lives. But it falls short of what the president was calling for. No ban on assault weapons, and the age to purchase those firearms will stay at 18. The vast majority of Republicans were opposed to those measures, even after hearing the pleas from the victims' families in Uvalde. Anything that you heard that would get you to support that? No. Because the stories are tragic, obviously. I have young kids, they're tragic for me. The truth of the matter is, is that raising the age from 18 to 21, all that does is take away the constitutional rights of 19 and 20 year olds in the United States. In a statement, the president writing the proposal does not do everything that I think is needed, but it reflects important steps in the right direction. Our thanks to Rachel Scott. Now to an alarming headline out of Texas, an armed gunman at a summer camp just outside of Dallas firing into a classroom with children inside, then moving to the gym where children were also present. Police responded within two minutes, shooting and killing the gunman. Let's get right to ABC's Kaylee Hartung. Kaylee, what do we know? Well, Lindsay, there were about 150 kids attending this summer camp at a field house when the gunman walked through the main lobby with a handgun. He encountered a staffer, and when some other counselors heard that gunfire, they called police and moved many of the children into a safe area of the field house and began locking the doors. The gunman headed that way, tried to get into a classroom, but he couldn't because the doors were locked. He did fire a shot into that classroom, but no one was injured. Then he moved into the gymnasium where more children were, but that is when police arrived. There was an exchange of gun gunfire there. The gunman was taken out. He later died from his injuries at the hospital, but the police chief stressing tonight his officers did what they were trained to do. They went in, stopped the threat, and no children or staffers there were harmed otherwise, Lindsay. And apparently they had just undergone active shooter training. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you. We shift now to our nation's economy, with Wall Street taking yet another drop in recession fears resurfacing. This is gas prices continue to rise, with Americans paying an estimated average more than $5 a gallon. ABC's Ariel Reshef brings us this report. Tonight, new fears of a recession after a dismal day on Wall Street. The S&P 500, the index tied to most 401ks, finishing down nearly 4% for the day and more than 20% for the year, officially entering so-called bear market territory. The stock market is suffering through a very bad case of indigestion because inflation has been surprisingly high and persistent. Persistent and getting worse. Prices rising from the grocery store to the gas pump. I'm definitely not buying premium. This Minnesota station sign saying it all. We hate our gas prices too. Now, major corporations are warning of even higher prices. Kraft Heinz, the company behind brands like Miracle Whip and Maxwell House Coffee, reportedly telling retailers it plans to raise prices later this summer. Last week, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen tried to dispel fears of a recession, but more and more prominent economists are now predicting one. Our thanks to Ariel and still to come, the grim discovery of two bodies during the search for a missing British journalist in the Amazon and the fascinating story about a community of women who moved to South Dakota in the 1800s because they wanted to get a divorce. This is ABC News Live.
with the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Brazilian police have said that they have found two bodies in connection with the disappearance of British journalist Dom Phillips and indigenous expert Bruno Pereiro. While police say they are waiting for final test results to confirm the identities of the two bodies, the wife of Dom Phillips and the local organization who led the search both confirmed to ABC News the bodies were indeed of the two. Surveillance footage of men assaulting two women in northeastern China unleashed a flood of outrage on lo local social media websites prompting calls for punishment and renewing a debate on women's rights. Video obtained by Reuters showed a man approaching a woman at a table in a barbecue restaurant and touching her before striking her after she pushed him away. Local police said two women had sustained injuries that were non-life-threatening and were being treated in the hospital. All nine suspects involved in the case were arrested. About one sandstorm a week has hit Iraq in the past few weeks, and what Iraqis say is the worst such spate in living memory. According to the country's Minister of Health, 250 people were treated in the hospital for suffocation since the storm started. Baghdad International Airport said in a statement earlier that flights were temporarily halted in the morning due to bad weather conditions but resumed later on. When you think of the history of women's empowerment in the United States, you might not often think of South Dakota in the late 1800s, but when the Dakota Territory's legislature expanded the right to get a divorce, women from across the country flocked to Sioux Falls to rid themselves of their husbands and find a liberation that they couldn't find anywhere else. Writer April White tells their stories in her new book, The Divorce Colony, How Women Revolutionized Marriage and Found Freedom on the American Frontier. Welcome to the show, April. Thank you, Lindsay. So give us a little background here. What was the situation like for a woman who might have wanted to get a divorce in the late 1800s and, and why South Dakota offered relief? In the late 1800s, you had these wildly different divorce laws in different states. So in some places, like for instance, South Carolina, you couldn't get a divorce at all. You had almost as strict laws in New York where you could only get a divorce with proof of adultery. And so women who could not get a divorce under the laws of their states went someplace with more permissive laws. And South Dakota had some of the most permissive laws in the country and the shortest residency requirements. They would have to go and live there for three months in the early 1890s in order to be able to file a divorce suit. And even in cases of abuse or abandonment, there were no grounds for divorce for women or men? No, there weren't. You could get a divorce of bed and board, which meant that you were still married but were allowed to live separately, um, but you would not be able to remarry under those terms. 
Oh, that's fascinating. And I, it's also interesting that back then you had to provide proof of adultery. It would seem like that's a lot easier to do now, but back then I wonder what you, you had to bring in as, as your evidence. But uh, beyond, that's beyond the point here. As far as the scores of women who decided to travel to South Dakota to end their marriage, describe for us what it was like in Sioux Falls during the, the height of this divorce boom. Sure, so you saw East Coast socialites, these were largely wealthy white women who had the wherewithal and the means to do this. Um, and they would take what was essentially a four day journey from the East Coast to Sioux Falls. And many of them lived at the Cataract House Hotel, which was the nicest hotel for hundreds of miles. And they really lived lives of leisure there because there was nothing else for them to be doing. It made them not particularly popular with the people in Sioux Falls, uh, except that they did like the money that these women were bringing in. I can imagine. And, and tell us about Maggie Carey in particular, a young relative of the famed Astor family who'd married a European baron. Why is her story so important? Yeah, so Maggie married uh, Baron de Stewers, who was a Dutch diplomat. Uh, she got her title, which was very fashionable at that time. Um, but her marriage was not particularly happy. She accused the Baron of cruelty, and later she believed that he was trying to institutionalize her in order to get control of her fortune, which was quite ample. So one night she fled from Paris, where she was living with her husband and her children, and eventually made her way to Sioux Falls. What makes her story so important is that it really sparks national attention to what's going on in Sioux Falls. Because she was so prominent, all the newspapers just turn the spotlight on the city. And it also sparks the backlash against what was going on there and sets up a war around divorce. And what about the role of husbands in all of this? Were they able to oppose a divorce? Yeah, so you, uh, you could oppose your divorce. Most people who went to Sioux Falls uh, liked the distance because the spouse would not follow, but you could absolutely put up a defense, and we saw some public trials in this era where a husband took on wife. And you write in the book that the women who traveled to Sioux Falls at the turn of the 20th century were not activists, but what might have been a quiet act of personal empowerment and self-determination became, in the glare of the national spotlight, a radical political act. How so? At this time, women did not have a lot of political power. They did not have a lot of economic power. But these women, in taking this extreme step to take agency over their own lives, forced the issue of divorce into the courts, into the legislature, all the way up to the White House and the Supreme Court. So simply by making this very personal decision, they made things change in rooms where they were not yet given access. April White, we thank you so much for joining us. You can find The Divorce Colony, How Women Revolutionized Marriage and Found Freedom on the American Frontier, wherever books are sold. Thank you. And still to come, one teen's remarkable story of perseverance. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. 
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. To some, it seems like a journey that's long and nearly impossible. But for 18-year-old Jake Tebow, there is no task too difficult to take on. The teen was seriously injured playing hockey and now is doing physical therapy that didn't exist only a few years ago at a one-of-a-kind facility in Massachusetts to regain his ability to walk. Reporter David B. Nick with our partner station WCVB has Jake's story in tonight's local lowdown. <laughs> Every inch is a struggle as Jake Tebow crawls across a mat. A month ago, Jake could not do this, and then a breakthrough. They were like, oh, just try by yourself, and I made it two mats, and I was like, oh, okay, holy cow. Five months after a fall on the hockey rink broke two of Jake's vertebrae and damaged his spinal cord, the 18-year-old has started a new kind of physical therapy. So can you tell me what the idea behind this therapy is? You can't walk without a strong core. That's like your base, same with skating. So uh, it's, it's good to get that as strong as possible and then move on from there. In addition to two days of standard rehabilitation, Jake comes four days a week to this facility in Canton, which specializes in helping people with paralysis regain movement. The hope is what they call neuroplasticity. I'm trying to rewire it, you know, and teach my brain that, like, you know, I can move my legs through this way instead of doing it, you know, and, and stuff like that. All right, ready? Stand yeah. up again. The sessions are grueling. Getting here from his home in Fitchburg is more than an hour's drive each way. And for this, insurance covers none of the cost. Keep it slow, slow, slow. But every day, Jake is getting stronger, and he believes this is the way he will walk again, not just someday, but in time for his high school graduation this coming June. I'm trying it, I, mean, I am, and so that's the goal. We'll have to follow up, hoping to see Jake walk across that stage for his diploma. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. The everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. You don't have to do this. Why is it so important? <laughs> I know, it, it just is. It touches you. It does. It's important to me. There may be no figure in show business as legendary as Jennifer Lopez. Don't stop, keep it moving, put your drinks up. With smash hits like On the Floor. And I'm real. Over here. 
From the dance floor to the big screen, and even on music's biggest stage, her name synonymous with the word success. The superstar has sold more than 70 million records worldwide, and together, her movies have earned a total of $3.1 billion. And at 52 years old, J.Lo is still plowing full steam ahead, helping to launch a bold new initiative to support Latina entrepreneurs and releasing a new documentary on Netflix. Part of being a great performer is being aware of whoever's around me right there. You feel me? In the film Halftime, J.Lo pulls back the curtain on the 2020 Super Bowl halftime show that made history. It was the first time two Latina artists headlined the world's biggest stage. But with the NFL's decision to have J.Lo and Shakira share top billing came frustration. It meant the hitmakers would need to split their time. Lopez saying in the documentary, this was the worst idea in the world. I'm trying to give you something with substance. I want something real. The doc revealing she fought to make her show pointed and political. In a reference to the immigration crisis, putting children, including her own daughter, in cages on stage and draping herself in a Puerto Rican flag. Only be five minutes, she'll be here, okay? In this exclusive clip from Halftime, J-Lo revealing what she told her daughter. I said, you look right down that camera and you tell every little girl in the world to get loud and to never, ever back down from bringing light to injustice. That year was a, just turned out to be an incredible year for me where everything I had worked for my whole life just kind of exploded in one year. All right, now bring it back. Known affectionately as Jenny from the Block. I'm still, I'm still Jenny from the Block. I used to have a little, now I have a lot. J-Lo has always stayed true to her Bronx roots and humble beginnings. You knocked down some roadblocks <laughs> to build what is now an empire. Thank you. How did you do it? You know, I have to thank my mom and my dad, who really instilled in me that I could do anything I wanted to do. At the MTV Awards, yes. you made a very emotional acceptance speech. I did. In which you said... I want to thank the people who gave me joy and the ones who broke my heart, the ones who were true and the ones who lied to me. You said... I want to thank those who lied to me, those who told me I couldn't do this. What did failure and disappointment teach you? It taught me to have to believe in myself. I had to. It forced me to do that. JLo's latest project is about giving back. Honestly, I'm hoping to kind of change the fabric of America, especially for Latino women. The music icon, following an introduction by Goldman Sachs, now partnering with nonprofit Grameen America. It's led by Andrea Jung, the longest serving female CEO of a Fortune 500 company. So our goal together is by 2030 to give out $14 billion of loan capital. That makes me smile. $14 billion. <laughs> $14 billion. Um, and it's a lot of loans. And we are going to touch 600,000 women entrepreneurs. Honestly, I'm still pinching myself. <laughs> I can't believe this is happening. One out of four businesses um, are Latinx owned in terms of small businesses in the United States. One out of every four? Over the last 10 years, um, they've grown 44%. And for women, Latino women entrepreneurs, the number's even higher. A 2020 report found that Latino-owned businesses are significantly less likely than similar white-owned businesses to have loans approved by national banks. The biggest hurdle for any minority group? I think there are so many systemic hurdles, Don, that we're all fighting, but one of them clearly is fair access to capital. Um, and when you look at the pathway to financial inclusion, over 50% of women in America are underbanked or unbanked. And I want to empower that community even more. And I think, you know, nobody wants a handout. They want to be able to build their own businesses. We want our own opportunities. We don't want to be there just because. We want to be there because we're just as good as. The average loan size is about $5,000, but along with the money, recipients also receive mentorship and financial literacy education. These are women who've been historically excluded from the financial mainstream. 
Uh, and often they come to the program with no credit score or a poor credit score because no one's taught them about credit card debt. And that's where I come in. It's like letting Latina women know, um, hey, this opportunity exists out here. You can go get this loan. If you need that $3,000 for that first month's rent for that business that you want, you can get it. You can have it. You know, the payback on this is like they pay back the loans like 90s. quickly. It, the, the percentages. She's better with all the percentages <laughs> and the numbers than I am. But it's um, like 99% <laughs> are yeah, paid it's back. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's like one of the best investments you can make in this country, I believe. Jennifer, why are Latinas so important to this country? What do they bring oh my goodness. that no other group can? <laughs> she used a great word, which I use all the time, which is grit. They're just tough. They're strong. They're made from a certain kind of fabric. That, ganas. Okay. Yes. Tienen ganas. Tienen chipa. They, they're, they're, they are entrepreneurial. They are inventive. They are creative. I'm still, I'm still Jenny from the block. Just like Jenny from the block, who's never forgotten where she came from. You've got the documentary. You've got this wonderful yes. new initiative. Yes, yes. And you've got an engagement. I do. And of course, I've got to ask you. I got to ask about Ben. Yeah. Okay. How's it going? <laughs> I mean, this is the best time of my life. I, I love my career, but nothing is more fulfilling to me than being able to build a family uh, with someone who I love deeply and who um, is just as dedicated to family and and to each other as we can be and uh I, i'm just i feel incredibly blessed when is the wedding <laughs> I you, I can't give you that one sorry with so much at stake in our world right now we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my, mom. my wife is born in really critical.